painful because I already know that. Uh, um, nicest thing somebody can say to me is that I'm beautiful. Uh, probably that like they think I'm cool and uh, they really they really like me. Very pleased up. I love you. You're a really good friend. I'm praying for you. I like your hair today. I think compliment. I love you. Oh, you're really nice. Like, how are you? Um, hi. My name is Jane. Would you want to be best friend? I like your earrings like that. I like your hair. <laughs> that, they, they are great. Like, nice. You're the best. I love you. Don't you be scared in the dark with no one. And they and they're really hiding behind the couch in case there's a ghost or a skeleton or a zombie. And they jump out, see there's no scary monster. And anything is stoppable a food fight. I learned a lot from our kids, isn't that great? We love them. Yeah, big round of applause for our kiddos. Uh, they taught us some good things to share. So do me a favor, turn to your neighbor and tell me either I like your hair or I like your earrings. Ready, set, go. All right, good, good. Those are our compliments. Thank you. Someone said they like my hair. I appreciate that. I'm glad you didn't say you like my earrings. That would have been weird. But I, anyways, I digress. Hey, it's been great having our kids. Great having you back here for our relationship series. So thank you for being here today. Thanks for joining us online. Thank you, Peru Crew, for being here as we close out our series today, discovering how do you have healthy, fulfilling, satisfying, Christ-honoring relationships with other human beings. <laughs> so this is for your friends, if you're married, for your spouse, if you're dating, for that person you're dating, you know, your grandkids, your stepkids, your foster kids, every person that ever has relationships with other human beings, this series is absolutely for you. And I pray that you've been remembering what it is we've been talking about through this series, like the art of communication, that everyone should be Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Good job. I hope you're annoying your family with those motions already. If there are some small potatoes in your life, overlook those small potatoes, right? Proverbs 19.11, it's one's wisdom yields to patience. It's to one's glory to overlook an offense. And if those big potato conflicts come up in your life that you're handling them Jesus' way, me and you, and then if that doesn't work, me and you and one or two. If that doesn't work, me and you and our church crew. And if that doesn't work, me and you take a break for a few while working towards a redo. And then last week, Pastor Harold here in Ottawa was talking about how do we make sure our hearts stay tender and not well done steak. That was great. Make sure that we're not that boot on the grill in our hearts, but keep our hearts tender. And in Peru, I was speaking about how do we make sure to peel that onion of forgiveness, layer by layer, breaking through that process of forgiveness and forgiving just as Christ has forgiven given us. Again, I pray you're not just hearing these things and remembering the hand motions. I pray you're actually living them out because Jesus himself said, the person who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, that person is like a wise person who built their house on the rock. And when the rains came and the winds blew, that house or that life stood firm. And I pray that that's what you're doing as well. You're living these things out. You're applying them. For some of you, you had some opportunities this weekend, didn't you? Because it was Thanksgiving. How many of you uh, celebrated some Thanksgiving this past weekend? Quite a few of us. Very good. Some of you are like, and I got to apply some things, Keith. I'm going to tell you right now, like Uncle Skippy, he was really something this weekend. Or Aunt Sally was on her little rant about politics. Or my neighbor came over and she was like, how do you like my tuna noodle Velveeta cheese lima bean casserole? And I was like... I was real slow to speak then, Pastor. I'm going to tell you right now, I was like, I got to be slow to speak. But I pray you're living these things out, not just today, but as we close out the series, that these are things you remember to do. Today, as we close out, I want to share with you one principle, one truth from God's message for us that has the ability to impact, to transform every relationship. It works in every relationship, and it works in any situation. And some of you are thinking, 
Any situation? Thank you for hypothetically wondering that. Yes, any situation. It's called the art of speaking life. The art of speaking life. And I tell you, if you have ever been in a spot where your relationship needed a little more life, <laughs> some encouragement, some strength, some hope, this is the message for you today, no matter where you are. I pray that your heart is ready and able to receive what God through His Word has to say to us. In week one of this series, we talked about the art of communication. I briefly touched on this verse and I said, we're going to take an entire message and dive in to the wisdom of God's Word in this passage because it is so life-giving. So that's what we're going to dive into today. However you've got God's message open, turn with me to the book of Proverbs, verse 18, or chapter 18, verse 21. Um, you've got your device, your Bible, uh, follow along the screen, and I pray you're taking notes today. Something incredible God has to say to you. I don't want you to miss it. No matter where you are, here, or if you're in Peru, if you're online, please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's message today. Proverbs 18, 21 Here's what God's word has to say to us today. The tongue, it has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. I love how the message paraphrase puts this passage. Listen to this. Words kill. Words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. Would you pray with me today? Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this truth this proverb, for this promise that you give us. And Lord, I'm just praying right here and right now, no matter what it is that we're dealing with in the relationships in our life, that we will experience all that you have to say to us. I agree with my sister, Pastor Sherry, in prayer. She said, I just pray for a revival, a revival in our relationships, a revival in our city, a revival in our hearts, that Jesus, you will begin reviving those places deep within us, that we can just know and experience you in all of your fullness, and that none of us would leave the same as when we came in, but know that we've experienced the living God in our midst today. Jesus, it's in your name that we ask all these things. Amen and amen. You may be seated. One of the biggest ships in the world is the USS Eisenhower. I wanted to show you a picture of it. This is a picture of the USS Eisenhower. It is 91,000 tons or about 12,000 elephants. I don't know why we always kind of measure things against elephants, but in my mind it helps. So about 12,000 elephants wise, okay? It's 1,100 feet long or three football fields. Um, it is 285,000 nuclear engineered power with horsepower. So, right, oh, power. Somebody like you thought your truck was powerful. Imagine 285,000 horsepower. Can fit 100 aircrafts. And, and listen to this. This is the most startling statistic, if you ask me. 6,100 people. 6,100 people can fit on the USS Eisenhower. That is a floating city, my friends. And as I was doing study and research, I was blown away by the fact of all that horsepower, all those aircrafts, all those people, all those hypothetical elephants that you could fit on board there. It's all steered. It's all directed. It's all controlled by this. This is called a rudder. And it is one-tenth of one-half percent size of the entirety of that vessel. All that power all that influence, all those people, all of it is steered by something one-tenth of one-half percent size of the entire vessel itself. I don't know about you, but I'm always blown away by things that are seemingly small but have enormous power to them. Have you noticed like I have that sometimes seemingly small things can actually be packed with an enormous amount of potential to change? I mean, think about it. The last three years, something enormously tiny, microscopic, the coronavirus, right? We can't even see it with the eye. What did it do to the world? Shut it down. Think about that. At one time I got out to my car and my vehicle wasn't starting right. And as I popped open the hood, guess what I found? A little mouse nest. And guess what happened? A little mouse scurried up in there and nibbled on my wire. And my whole car shut down by a little tiny mouse. A little tiny mouse. And my whole car shut down. Wouldn't even start up. And I thought about that. I thought, something so small can actually be quite powerful, can it? Many of you, because you're smart, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? <laughs> Our passage today talks about something else that is small physically in comparison with the rest of our body, but actually is loaded with power, isn't it? 
If you don't believe me, just look again at what God's message has to say to us. Look at what it says. And let's say that second word together, the what? The tongue, this little tiny part of your body. It has the what? It has power. The tongue has the power. And just in case you're wondering, what kind of power does it have? Life and death power. In other words, there is power in the words that we speak, isn't there? And many of you know exactly what it is that we're talking about today, because if we were to use the ship or vessel analogy some more here, we'd understand that many of you know exactly what it's like for some powerful words that someone has spoke about you in a relationship that you're in, maybe a friendship or a marriage, or your kids speaking back to you, and those words steered your relationship (laughs) maybe towards life, Maybe towards death. I pray that you don't have to think too long before you can recall someone speaking words of life over you, like encouragement, right? Hey, you got this. We believe in you. You can do this. Her words of support. Hey, we're in your corner. We're not going to let you down. We are with you every single step of the way. I pray you can remember words of love. I pray you had a good experience. Maybe a a mom or a dad looked at you and said, I can't believe I get to be your dad. I can't believe I get to be your mom. That God would give me such amazing kids as you is beyond my wildest imagination. I hope it doesn't take long for you to think about a time when somebody's words spoke life into you and into your relationships. As a matter of fact, this is so important to me. I don't want anyone to miss out on this opportunity. So I'm going to invite you to do something for just a moment. I'm going to invite you to speak some life over those around you right now. And don't worry, you don't have to make up your own phrase. I came up with one for you, okay? Turn to your neighbor and just tell them, you're more awesome than pie. Ready, set, go. There you go. Online, I expect you to do that too. Thank you for someone whoever said I'm more awesome than pie. I appreciate that. Online, put it in the chat section too. Make sure we know. Hey, important, isn't it, to speak life in those moments? And obviously we're being kind of funny there, but there is something about having words of life spoken to you and how they can shape and mold your life, encourage you, support you, feeling loved and accepted. But many of us probably know the other as well, don't we, unfortunately, A moment where someone spoke some words to us that didn't speak life, that that brought even death, brought darkness, despair, discouragement. Maybe someone said, you're a failure. You're never going to measure up. You're never going to be good enough. It's interesting how those words can stick with us. The power of those words can stick with us. And maybe they were even said only once, long ago, maybe decades ago, but Somehow, in a way that we can't even fully comprehend, even though they were said years ago, they still impact us today, don't they? And that's because words can change a life. Words can change a life. They truly can. And that's what God's Word says to us today. So I think here's the question for us. How will we use this power of our words? Since we've all been endowed with this power, if you've got a tongue, if you're able to speak, since you all have this power, how will you choose to use this power? The power of our words. Will you choose to use it to speak life or to speak death? I thought about how the best way to illustrate this, and I couldn't get over my illustration from earlier, so I thought really the best way to illustrate this is with one of these. Like my steering wheel. I got it from Amazon. There we go. I thought about this really in reality. What our words are like, they're like this steering wheel. Every word is taking us somewhere because the steering wheel directs the rudder and the rudder directs the entire ship. And I thought how true that is. The tongue that we have, the words that we speak, it directs the rudder of our relationships. See what I did there? Huh? Huh? Yeah, right. Pretty good if I do say so myself. So I thought about this for a minute. I thought, how will we use the power that God has given us at our disposal in the relationships of our lives? In our marriage, will we choose to use these words to steer towards life in our marriage or steer towards death? Steer towards those moments of health and wholeness in our friendship or towards devastation? Will we choose to use it in our workplaces to steer towards life-giving relationships or towards death? I firmly believe, my friends, that our Heavenly Father has given us these words at our disposal because He desires for us to speak life. 
for us to turn towards life in any and every relationship that you and I are a part of. For our friendships, for our marriage relationship, for those of us who are married, with our kids, our stepkids, our foster kids, our grandkids, whatever it is that you find yourself in a relationship, you and I have been given this incredible power. I mean, a power to speak life for death. And I believe our Heavenly Father wants us to steer and direct all of our relationships towards the passageways of life. And so the question, of course, is, well, how do we do that, Pastor Keith? I'm, again, glad you hypothetically asked because I want to answer that for you. Today, I want to share with you what I call a little acronym. It's how we actually speak L-I-F-E. How do we speak L-I-F-E? And again, I've given this to you in acronym form as one way to help you remember what it is that we're going to talk about today. So we already have quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. We already have potatoes, so potatoes are ruined for you. You're going to think about this every time you see potatoes, the series. Now I pray that every time you see the word life, that you'll remember what God through his holy scriptures calls us to do. What does it look like for us to speak life? How do we speak life in our relationships? Four things. Each one starts with a letter. The first thing we're called to do is this. I think we're called to linger, okay? In other words, just chill for a moment. Just hang on. Before you use this powerful word power at your discretion, just Hold on a second. Just take a moment and linger. Do me a favor. Just turn to your neighbor and tell them real chill life. Just tell them linger. There you go. Right? Just linger for a moment. Right? Good. Whole different vibe now, isn't there? I hope the same thing for you joining us online and in Peru. Hey, we're not really good at lingering. Have you noticed this? The world in which we live does not often tell us, hey, just chill, just linger for a moment. What do we actually say? Get her done, right? Like, hey, where's my stuff? Why didn't my friend text me back? It's been two minutes. Can't believe it. Wait, two minutes. Hey, this is the season of shopping. How many of you have ever said, where's my package? Right? (laughs) Supposed to be here today. Estimated time of delivery is 5 a.m. or 5 p.m. It's 5.30. (laughs) That's it. Someone's getting a nasty message at Amazon, right? This is what I pay for Prime for. Maybe you've been in a drive-thru and you said, this is supposed to be fast food. Where's my food? Or maybe you've even got to a spot where you've been downloading a movie and that little buffer wheel comes up and you're like, oh, I don't have time for this. Click. You click out of the movie. We live in a world where lingering, just waiting, just pausing, just holding for a moment is not encouraged. And we felt the results of that, haven't we? All right, moment of corporate honesty. How many of you would admit to, in the heat of the moment, saying or doing something without thinking about it that you immediately regretted? You wish you could take those words back. Great. Tell your neighbor the worst thing you've ever... No, don't do that. That's a bad idea, right? (laughs) But many of us know exactly what it's like because we didn't linger, because we didn't pause. We didn't filter through our mind what emotions were going through in our heart, and we just emotionally vomited that person we're in relationship with. In that moment, some damage has been done, hasn't it? And many of us could probably explain that. Yeah, that's why my friend blocked me. That's why I can't go back to that restaurant. That's why I had to make up this excuse of someone must have hacked my social media account, because I never would have said anything like that, right? But there's something so important about these words, remember, because they have enormous power, don't they? They could steer a relationship towards life or towards death. And so if they have so much power, if we have so much power in the words we speak, doesn't it make sense for us before we use this power to just linger, just hold on, just chill for a moment? Hey, how about this? Before you use these words, pray about it. Hey, Lord, before I enter into this conversation, would you lead and guide me? Would you grant me wisdom? Holy Spirit, if something is not of you, would you just stop me in my tracks? Because I don't want to say or do anything that would lead this relationship towards death instead of life. What if we just took time to to linger? That's the first thing. Second thing is this. You've got to be intentional. You've got to be intentional. Um, It's incredible to me that these words, which are so powerful, how sometimes we can be careless with them. Careless is kind of the different of intentional. Intentional is being one thing, and careless is kind of being flippant. 
And it's intriguing, something with so much power, we can sometimes be so careless with. I thought about that. When you have something of great power, you try to do your best to teach people how to be careful or intentional with them, don't you? When we were teaching our daughter how to drive, we realized this is an important moment. This is a powerful thing that she has, a tool at her disposal. So we wanted to make sure that she knew, hey, you've got to be intentional about how you drive the things that you do. Don't be careless with this thing because there's great power you are now in control of. Same thing with my son. He just went through hunter safety. And when you have firearm training, one of the most important things they teach you is you have something of great power. Don't treat it carelessly. Be very careful because great power is in your hands. I couldn't help but think about it, and I'm going to see who else agrees with me. How many of you think that we should have to go through a class before we're able to use the words that we speak, right? Wouldn't that be a good idea? I mean, we just walk around with these loaded weapons with all this power at our disposal, and no one gives us any training, right? We just walk around, and and obviously I, I jest a little bit with you, but some really damaging things can happen when we're careless, not intentional, with the words that we speak, right? How many of you would admit that you've been hurt by some careless words that people have spoken about you? Yeah. Did you know you're not the only one? That that Jesus himself, he gives us warnings about the words that we speak in Matthew chapter 12, and he's talking to some religious leaders, and they're just saying some things that Jesus is like, wait, I got to put you guys just on blast for a moment. Time out. Are you thinking about what you're saying? And look what Jesus actually says to them in Matthew chapter 12. He says this, let me tell you something. And again, these are the words of Jesus. Every one of these careless words, there's that phrase, is going to come back to haunt you. There will be a time of reckoning. Words are what? There he says it again. Take them seriously. Words can be your salvation. They can also be your damnation. See the choice there again? I love how the NLT says it this way. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. In other words, Jesus says these idle words, and that word that he says, the idle words that we speak, it's a phrase we could use in English. We could translate that word being almost insignificant. Almost little flippant things that we say, right? Like, ah, it's no big deal. That's just how I talk about Republicans. That's just what I say about Democrats, you know. Ha, 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 you know. My kids know I'm just kidding, right? My neighbor knows I'm just joshing with them, right? And Jesus looks at us and he says, hey, just, I want to remind you that there is power in the words that you speak. Don't be careless with something that has such incredible power. Life or death power is in the tongue. And Jesus himself says, don't be careless with this power. Be intentional with the words that you speak. Think through them. Pray through them. Don't be careless with this enormous power that God has given us. That's the I. Got to be intentional. Then the F is this. Then we got to foster relationships. Anyone here ever tried to win an argument before? Right? How's that gone for you? As a matter of fact, just for fun, the next time you're talking with your spouse or your friend, hey, I'm going to try to win this argument. See how it goes from you after that, right? That was a joke. Please don't do that. That's terrible advice. I was just kidding. But there is something about that. Sometimes we approach conversations and relationships with a win-lose mentality. And let me tell you, if you approach a relationship with win or lose, you've already lost. (laughs) Because you know, as well as I do, that you can win an argument, but still lose a relationship. And so one of the things I love the most about Jesus and the way that he was always with people is he was always trying to foster relationship. He didn't see people as ones to be defeated or arguments to be won. He saw them as people to be ministered to, even people who are incredibly different than him. And I wonder what would happen if we did the same thing. If we realize that people like you, who are not like you are not the enemy, they're the mission. I wonder what would happen if that were the case. People who are not like you are not the enemy. They're actually the mission. And what would it look like for you to approach that person not as an argument to be won, 
but actually someone to minister to, and an opportunity for maybe you to get through a hard time when you didn't see eye to eye on something, a way for you to foster relationship, to use this powerful word that God has given you at your discretion to speak life into this relationship, to foster relationship, that together with whoever that is, that spouse of yours, that kid, that grandkid, that coworker at your place, what would it look like for us to foster relationship with the words in which we speak? And then the, the last one, the E, is this. you got to express loving truth. And all of those words are important. Express what kind of truth? Loving, loving truth. But both those words, love and truth, they matter. Not just love and not just truth. Um, I was reminded of this when I was preparing the message today, Ephesians chapter 4 Verse 15, God gives this amazing church in Ephesus this really incredible appeal. And, and I want you to see what he says to us. He says this, instead, we will speak the what? Truth in love. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. And then here's the reason why. Growing in every way more and more like who? Like Christ. Not just love, not just truth, but truth and love together. I don't know if you're anything like me, but sometimes when it comes to relationships, I feel like I've got a choice to make. Ooh. Am I going to be loving in this relationship or am I going to be truthful in this relationship? And God through his word says, either of those extremes is not the right one. You have to blend the two together. You have to speak truth, but you have to do it in a really loving way. I heard a pastor named Steve Thomason who said it so brilliantly that the important point of having these two together and what happens, the danger of what happens when we separate them and speak one instead of the other, or one at the expense of the other. He says this, he says, truth without love is abuse, but love without truth, that's enablement. And I was like, mind-blowing when he said that. You need both truth and love. And many of you remembered a, a few weeks ago when we were talking about Jesus' way to deal with those big potato conflict, that I told you this. I said, hey, and a rule of thumb is this, go in love or don't go at all. If you can't speak the truth, you don't speak it at all. But I want to add one thing to it because I think this is so important. The reason I said that is because your words aren't spoken in a vacuum, are they? They're received by a real person with a real life. And these words, according to God, is actually leading you somewhere. It's steering that relationship towards life or towards death. And so it's so important for us to remember that when we walk into these conversations to speak words of life. And if you can't speak in love, don't speak it at all. But here's one thing that I would add, and I was convicted when I read this. I said, I need, I need to change my phrase. And here's how I would change it. Yeah, I would say this, what's the most loving and truthful way to say this? What's the most loving and truthful way to say this or to address this? Because it's not one or the other, it's both and. How do I speak both truth and love in this relationship? How do I do that? So what would it look like for us in those moments to, to linger just for a minute, to be intentional, not careless with the words we speak, to foster relationship, not to see that person in relationship as someone to be defeated, as an argument to be won, but rather as someone that I can love and foster relationship with, and then to express both loving truth, truth and love in our conversation. I think you do that. You take that steering wheel of your relationship and you steer towards life, not towards death. I, I'm going to do something a little different as we close this series in a little bit. And I've got two challenges, and then I'm going to give you, or excuse me, two questions, and then a challenge in a little bit. But the first question is this. Hey, is there any careless words that you need to ask forgiveness for? Just a good question for us to ask. As we're kind of going through this together, maybe you're starting to think about a late or a conversation that happened lately in one of your relationships. And the more you think about it, we started to think about careless words. You immediately thought of something that you know that that conversation led towards death in the friendship or in your marriage or with your kids. And you know that God's calling you to, to do something about this, my friends. What a perfect opportunity for us to walk through what Jesus taught us just a couple weeks ago to work through conflict revolution in a way that brings healing and hope. But that's the first one, and I pray that your mind is clear. But if not, if Holy Spirit brings someone to mind, please act sooner rather than later. Don't let that wound fester and that relationship continue to die. Speak life into it and start to steer back in the direction of what God has for that relationship. 
But then the second one is this. How can I speak life here and now? And this applies to every relationship you're in right now. When you talk to your friends as you're making your way out of church today, I pray that you're like, hey, how can I bring life into this relationship? How can I support? How can I encourage? If there's a little oddness going on between us, I'm going to speak that truth, but I'm going to do it in a really loving way. How can you speak life into that relationship, your friendship with your kids, your grandkids, whoever it is that you're in relationship with? What would it look like for you to begin speaking life? You never know how even the simplest of words can change a trajectory of a friendship, of a life, even from people you may not know yet. I'll never forget the time that this became really apparent and evident to me. This was when I was a really young father, and we were pastoring in Arizona at the time. And my kids were probably about eight and four at the time. Uh, Anna was eight, Amos is four. And we went to one of those big inflatable uh, places. We're indoors, and they have all those inflatable bouncy houses and slides, you know, where we call them the ACL terrors. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about, right? And just feel like you're just looking at them and tearing ACL. Um, but my kids loved it and they were having such a blast and we got to go and you went for a certain amount of time and they could go down as many slides as they wanted to, bounce on as many bouncy houses as they want to. And there are about five or six, if I'm remembering correctly, in this little indoor facility. And for, for my life, this passage has always been something that's been influential to me. My mom and my dad were big life speakers over me. So I grew up in an environment where I was blessed to have parents that lived this principle out. They spoke life over me. And so I was just blessed to, to know, I think that's what you do. And so with my kids, they'd be going down the little slide and, and I'd say, say stuff like, hey, you did such a great job. Man, that was amazing. I'm so proud of you. Great job. Let's do it again. And then they'd run back up the slide and they'd go down. And this was going on for quite a while. And I'll never forget is we're just kind of enjoying some father and son and daughter and mom is there. And we're all just kind of enjoying this family time together. That before I knew it, we were doing it maybe for a few minutes. And as I looked up at my kids getting ready to go down the slide again, I felt something beside me. I felt this little tug in my pants. And here's a little tiny kid who I don't even know who he is. And he's just tugging on my pants. And I looked down and I said, hey, buddy. And this is what he said. He goes, will you do that for me? And I said, what do you want me to, what do, you want me to do? And I'll never forget what he said. He goes, I'll go down the slide and you say good job. Isn't that great? So you know what I said? No, too bad. No, of course I didn't say that, right? <laughs> That'd be a terrible story. I said, buddy, I would love to do that. And so he ran back up the slide and he went down and guess what I said? Oh, great job. Let's see you do it again. Anyone want to guess what happened next? Another kid came. <laughs> he said, hey, will you do that for me? And my friends, this is not any exaggeration. Ask my wife if you don't believe me. This went on until every single kid in the inflatable bounce house place, except for two 12-year-old preteens who were too cool for school in the corner going like this. <laughs> every kid was there. And they would go down the slide and they'd wait for me to say good job and pat them on the back and say, you can do it again. One kid even one time said, hey, will you take a picture of me like you're taking a picture of your kids? I said, no, you can get arrested for that. But anyways, I'll be happy to cheer you on and it'd be great. And we did this for a long amount of time until we actually, our time allotment had run out and I had to leave. And my friends, I kid you not, at the end of that time when we got ready to leave, there was an audible groan. And I said, guys, I've got to go now, but you all did such a great job. And they all went, oh... What's the moral of that story? I want to tell you what it is. You have no idea how much just the smallest of words can speak life. And I'll tell you one of the things that was the most profound to me. I, I've gone to seven years of advanced education. <laughs> I went to my undergrad and then I went to seminary and I didn't use any of that for that moment in the playhouse. <laughs> the inflatable, and that's the thing, right? You don't need a theology degree to do that. You don't need to go to seminary to do that. All you need to do is express and understand that in your possession is this great and incredible power, power to speak life. And so my question for you and for me is this. I know relationships are hard these days, but I believe that in your life and in your sphere of influence, it may be in an inflatable bounce house, it may be in your office, it may be in your family, I believe there's a chance for you to speak some life into the relationships that God has already placed you in and see some transformation that only He can do in you. I want to send you with one more verse that God has been challenging me and convicting me of lately. And I would love for you to pray this verse with me this week. It's from Psalm 141. And can I tell you it's a challenge? It's a challenge. 
But this is what I'm trying to pray. And I invite you to pray it with me. Look at what it says in Psalm 141, verse 3. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Isn't that good? In other words, before it comes out here, ask Holy Spirit to inspire it here. And remember, whatever comes out here is going to steer your relationship in one way or the other. Lord, help us to steer towards life. Life in our friendships, life with our kids, life with our spouse, life with everyone that you've given us the ability to use this incredible power for. Would you stand with me today? I'm going to invite our praise team to come forward. I want to just invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. We're going to sing a song that's kind of an upbeat song. We're going to get out of here. Um, We're going to be glad. And the reason we're going to be glad is because you're walking out of here with some serious firepower, my friends. And you didn't know it, but you had it when you walked in here. But now that you're aware of it, what will you do with the power that God has entrusted to your care? I pray that you use that power, the powerful tongue and the words that you speak to steer your relationship toward life. Hey, would you bow your heads with me today? What relationships in your life right now is Holy Spirit convicting you that need some life that you need to speak into right here and right now? Would you just in a way that only you can just surrender yourself and say, Lord, help me to do it. (laughs) I don't know what things have been going on with your kids or with your spouse or at your workplace or with your neighbors, but I trust and believe that as you walk out of this place today, you're going to get a chance to use these powerful words to do something. And I pray you'll choose to use them to do some good, to bring some life into sometimes a very dark and painful world. Lord Jesus, we come before you and we thank you that you've challenged us today to remember that we have so much power in something seemingly so small. And yet here we are going to walk out of this place in just a few moments. And I pray that you will allow us to be intentional about these words, that we'll linger just for a moment, that we'll foster those relationships and we'll express loving truth in and through all of it, that our relationships can be filled with a life that only you can bring. Lord Jesus, it won't be easy, but we trust and believe that you are the one who empowers us to do that what it is you've called for us to do. Lord, we ask it all in your name. And everybody said, amen.